Hello, my name is Dr. Victoria Russell, and I am a professor of foreign language education in Spanish at Valdosta State University, and I am the Actful Distance Learning SIG Chair. And my co-presenter is Dr. Pete Swanson. He's a professor of foreign language education in Spanish at Georgia State University. He was the president of Actful in 2016, and he is currently serving as the past president of Actful, and he's a national expert in foreign language education, so I'm absolutely delighted that he is my co-presenter today on the presentation, Building Your Core, Effective Practices for Online Language Learners and Educators. And these core practices really fall under the umbrella of the communicative language teaching approach. This is a flexible approach that employs techniques that optimize the language acquisition process in the classroom. And it's really important for online educators to understand that these practices are equally important in the online environment as in the traditional brick and mortar second language classroom. Well, thank you, Victoria. As you know, fostering a strong sense of efficacy is critical for both teachers and learners. By that, I mean that it's a person's judgment about his or her abilities to organize and execute courses of action that are necessary to achieve designated types of performances. And while many teachers are accustomed to teaching in the traditional face-to-face -face format, teaching languages online can be an effective way to build one's sense of efficacy in language learning and to learn a new language. In fact, two recent publications have really changed the way that many language teachers are approaching language teaching and learning. As a former high school uh, Spanish teacher, now as a teacher educator at Georgia State University here in Atlanta, the standards movement has really changed my practice. In that, the standards really helped me make the paradigm shift from a focus on form to community of language teaching approaches. And with the development and the creation of the can-do statements, I know for a fact that my sense of efficacy in teaching Spanish has increased, and my students believe that they can acquire a new language has increased as well. It's important that teachers foster learner autonomy and that students begin to problem solve. And with the new necessary actual intercultural community can-do statements that Nassess and Actful have been working on with a variety of language experts from around the nation, I believe that language teachers have even more tools to bring students to higher levels of language learning. I can't say enough about these resources and I encourage everyone to get copies. They can be found on the actual website. Victoria? Yes, I just wanted to point out that the, the top bullet point, fostering that self-directedness, that is something that is really probably easier to achieve in the online learning environment than in a traditional brick and mortar classroom. That's because students have much more control over their own learning. Um, in my institution, we set up our courses for any time, any place learning. So the learner controls when and where the learning takes place. So that fits right in here. I would agree completely with you. Over the past couple of years, Victoria, you know, I've been working with Dr. Ann Halas Cummins at the University of Wisconsin at Eau Claire on a teacher re uh, retention project here in Atlanta. And I've learned so much about the high leverage teaching practices due to her groundbreaking research in the field. And by a high leverage teaching practice, I'm talking about those practices that are essential for novice teachers to enact in their classrooms to support second language learning and development. And of course, as this slide shows, high leverage practices are those tasks and activities that are essential for uh, skillful beginning teachers to understand, to take responsibility for, and be prepared to carry out in order to enact their core instructional responsibilities. Several years ago, ACTFL began to focus on what these tasks and skills that novice educators need to become effective language teachers are. And of course, the set of core practices emerged from this work. I don't mean to turn this into a into kind of a presentation that's, you know, PowerPoint that's a reading exercise, but the slides summate the characteristics of the core practices. Basically, in a nutshell, they've been shown to be powerful in advancing student learning, and they're complex um, instructional practices that novices and perhaps veterans alike are not able to learn through modeling alone. Each of the core practices are unique and must be deconstructed, explicitly taught to help teachers realize how to use them 
for instructional purposes. Victoria and I will be yes. presenting and discussing each of these six. Victoria, jump on in here. Yes, I just wanted to point out in the upper right hand corner, you know, as Pete pointed out, these core practices are not transparent or learnable through modeling alone. And the online mentoring program that we are collaborating with the National Foreign Language Resource Center and ACTFL is really going much beyond that. Um, the, the mentees are embedded in the mentors course. They are viewing the modules and presentations and then further discussing and reflecting on them with the mentors. So the whole purpose is for them to get a, a deep knowledge of these core practices and learn them through multiple um, activities rather than just modeling alone. Oh, I completely agree. And, you know, with the, the core practices, of course, there's these large grain and small grain core practices. And let me just go back one here but before you know it's important to understand that these practices you know are, are very complex let's take target language use as an example we know that actful recommends using the target language at least 90 percent of the time in the target language classroom of course dual language is 100 percent but using the target language is key for learners to acquire the language and when you examine the target language usage by the teacher using gestures is a great way of staying in the target language so the students know what they're talking about, of course, the use of visuals and or visuals, I'm sorry, and even acting out actions can increase the student understanding. And of course, depending on what's being taught here, um, there's a set of moves that can be done to aid student understanding. So when you're examining the core practices, you have to keep that in mind. At this time, core ACTFL has identified six core practices that novice educators should be doing in the classroom to, to increase student proficiency. Let me take a moment and introduce each one of them, and then Victoria and I will talk about them in depth. First, we have facilitating target language comprehensibility. This is where students and teachers speak, listen, read, and write, and view, and create in the target language at least 90% or more during the classroom time. You get lots of comprehensible input. It's all used in meaningful context with interactions. Second one is guiding learners through interpreting authentic resources. Of course, presenting interactive reading and listening comprehension tasks using authentic cultural texts. Uh, with appropriate scaffolding while promoting interpretation. The third one in the green is designing oral interpersonal communication tasks. In the purple, we have the planning with backwards design. And the fifth is the teaching grammar as a concept and using it in context, right? And then finally, we have the providing oral feedback. And so when you think about facilitating target language comprehensibility, right? Notice here that there's both the student and the teachers are using the target language at least 90% of the time. And of course, this is aligned with what Stephen Crash and work and others, you know, are talking about the importance of using the target language for instructional purposes. Now, it's important to remember that not all of the target language must come directly from the teacher. I mean that there are so many great resources that can be used by teachers, such as videos and newscasts, social media, blogs. I mean, there's, there's just so many. And by teaching online, Instructors can use a myriad of all these great resources. We were talking about the six core practices and we're on practice one, which is facilitating target language comprehensibility. But I just wanted to go back and, and mention very briefly that the online mentoring program will help provide the skill set, knowledge base, tools and applications to enact these practices in the online language learning environment. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about right now is how to facilitate that target language comprehensibility online. In a regular classroom, you know, ACTFL recommends that teachers speak using the target language at least 90% of the time. The same thing has to happen in the online classroom. Well, how do you do that? With the model that we use here at my university, the Anytime, Anyplace Learning, I create instructional videos in the target language for my students that I caption. So the, if students have a disability such as they're hard of hearing or they're deaf, they need that captioning, but it also helps students who don't have a hearing disability because they can see the target language written out on the screen as they're hearing it. They can also go back and listen to the videos again and again, but it's key to use that, that comprehensible input when you are recording your instructional videos. 
first of all, you don't want the videos to be too long. You want to keep them no more than 20 minutes. I usually have my students view three to four, 15 to 20 minute videos per week in the target language. And sometimes I'll ask them to watch them twice if the concept is particularly difficult. And it's really important when you're teaching uh, uh, grammar and vocabulary that you're, use, you're creating a meaningful cultural context. And you can do that very easily online by using images, cartoons, drawings. Um, I point to things when I'm speaking about them so that the students are aware of what I'm talking about. And they're getting lots and lots of comprehensible input. So that's something that is possible in the online environment and necessary. We must do the same things online that we're doing for students in a traditional brick and mortar classroom. Now, facilitating presentational speaking is really not that difficult. Um, especially if you're doing it in the asynchronous mode. That means that you're not doing it at the same time. Um, so st students can work either with a partner or individually or in a small group to prepare a presentation and record it when it, it's convenient for them. They can answer discussion prompts, uh, engage in role plays. These are things that they're preparing for in advance. And so therefore it is the presentational mode. They're not interacting in real time. That would be synchronous communication in the online environment. And so language learners, when they're recording these presentations, before they post them, we're all human beings. We want to know what we sound like before we share it with someone else. So what they do is they go back and they listen to their recording. And most of the time, they're not happy with it the first, second, maybe even third time. And so they're recording over and over again. They're listening to their own output, which becomes auto input. In that case, they're actually improving in their accents. I have taught third semester Spanish in the same semester face-to-face -face and online. And I found that by the end of the semester, my online students actually had better accents in the target language because they, ha they were exposed to a lot of auto input where the classroom learners really didn't have that. There are several audio recording tools that are free. You have Vocaroo, the online voice recorder, SpeakPipe. I've got the URLs there so you can, you can look at those um, after this presentation and explore them. I also want to point out VoiceThread. You can um, make up to four voice threads for free, but it is something that would cost money if you wanted to use more than four. VoiceThread is like a discussion board but for speaking. So I can uh, create a question, speak my question, I can use my webcam so students can see me. And then later when students have time, they can go back and answer me, they can respond to each other. And it really infuses your personality into the course and your students' personality. It gives them a sense of presence of their peers and presence of the instructor. So this is a really powerful tool. But because students are preparing these in advance, um, they often tell me that they spend much more time on a voice thread voice board than on a written discussion board because they know they're going to be seen and heard by their peers. And so they're getting lots of practice in advance and that is definitely the presentational mode. Well, the second core practice is designing interpersonal communicative activities. Of course, this is framed within the three modes of communication. The interpersonal mode is that two-way communication with active negotiation of meaning among individuals. Of course, it's spontaneous speech and usually involves an exchange of information. Such an exchange means that during a conversation, for example, a student being asked the question does not know the answer already. He must listen to the question in order to formulate an answer to that question. Such activities are focused on the communication goal area of the World Readiness Standards, but of course, can include other goals as well. So one thing you have to take into account when you are in an online environment is this synchronous versus asynchronous communication. Synchronous means the communication is happening at the same time. And you really need to keep that in mind when designing interpersonal activities because you really need to have that synchronous interaction to make that happen. When it's asynchronous, students will have time to prepare in advance. So you really have to think about is the activity that I am designing here, is it uh, synchronous or asynchronous? Is it interpersonal 
or presentational because we know that we want to engage our students in all three modes of communication. So we have the presentational, interpersonal, and interpretive. And of course, the highlights of the practice here um, are, are really relatively simple to, to kind of get an understanding of. And let me just kind of build a PowerPoint here really quickly. As I mentioned earlier, interpersonal communication involves the students listening to each other, right? And of course, the activation of background um, knowledge and providing scaffolding are much needed. So it's part of that whole critical process of, of acquiring the language. However, it's not rehearsed language. Of course, what Victoria and I are talking about is that is that students write a conversation together, then read it aloud. That is not interpersonal, that is presentational, right? The key to interpersonal communication is negotiation of meeting and interpreting what the speaker is saying in order to answer them and move on with the conversation. So we're talking about facilitating interpersonal speaking online, this is the greatest challenge, I believe. I've been teaching a language online for about 10 years. And it's gotten easier as new applications come out. Um, one way that you can facilitate that is to have students meet in small groups, individually, in pairs, and interact in the virtual classroom. Uh, most campuses and schools have some kind of technology where you can have a virtual classroom. Here at my campus, we have Blackboard Collaborate, there's Zoom, there's many other programs where students can get together with their teachers and have that virtual meeting space. That is one way to enact those interpersonal language tasks in your classroom. The virtual classrooms also allow for breakout rooms where you can put students in pairs, and that's ideal for that synchronous pair work. In my campus, though, that's not a possibility because we are required to have any time, any place learning. And so the way that I have solved the issue of the interpersonal speaking tasks is to use applications such as Talk Abroad, Envivo, and the new one is Ling We Link. Talk Abroad is an application where my students have to engage in 30-minute conversations with native speakers. I provide the questions in advance, but the native speakers never stick to a script or use those exact questions. They're always tweaking them and changing them a bit. So therefore, it certainly is the interpersonal speaking mode. They have to negotiate meaning. They have to get their meaning across. And the focus is on meaning, even though they're practicing the grammar and the vocabulary that we cover in our courses in, 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 in class, they are practicing it, but in a real world way with these native speakers. And Vivo is the same concept as Talk Abroad. And Lingui Link is a new program that is um, coming out this fall. That is, it's, it's a conversation exchange where students, um, they have to give a 30 minute conversation in their native language. So if your student's native language is English, they will then get a credit to receive a 30-minute conversation with a native speaker of the language they're learning. In my case, it's Spanish. And so this is a wonderful program because it's not costly at all. It's very inexpensive, and students are still getting that synchronous practice. The other programs, Talk Abroad and En Vivo, there is a cost to it. But uh, I teach at the college level, and I feel that if, you know, textbooks cost money, some resources cost money. And for me, there's, no, there's, there's nothing more important when learning a foreign language than using that language with native speakers. And this really facilitates my students building their proficiency in the target language online. I think this is a, a wonderful uh, opportunity for online students to build their fluency in a foreign language. Great, I'm gonna to to check out Lingui Link. It sounds very, very interesting. The next core practice, core practice number three, is talking about teaching grammar as a concept and of course using it in context. Now this third core practice really changed the way that uh, I taught as a, as a high school Spanish teacher. Of course, I'll talk about that later, but thank you to Judith Strom and Eileen Glisson, the authors of the Teacher's Handbook, well in advance, because it just changed my practice. At any rate, teaching grammar as a concept and using it in, in context is key to students understanding how the grammar works and then being able to use it, which of course is the goal for my students. 
I want them to be able to communicate in the target language and not just know the grammar rule of the day. The central point here is to keep in mind that the research shows that students focus on meaning well before they focus on form. If you need to, take a look at Bill Van Patten's work on that for more details. Therefore, teachers should teach grammar with the idea that students learn how to use that grammar to communicate in meaningful contexts. As a novice Spanish teacher, of course, I was trained in the 1980s and used a kind of a variety of traditional approaches to teaching grammar. I relied, relied heavily on the textbook and provided students with those drill and kill mechanical exercises using grammar like conjugate the verb and fill in the blank with the right adjective, if you know what I mean. And then I wonder why the students couldn't function in the interpersonal mode. Well, it's important to remember that grammar is a tool and, of course, not a goal. Highlights of this practice. The current sociocultural theory supports this, um, that the focus after form after meaning has been established. And the PACE model is a dialogic form um, that's based in a story where you focus on the form. And it, the PACE is just simply an acronym, okay? After getting the, the copy of the Sherman Glisson Teacher's Handbook, I learned about this PACE model. Right? And, you know, for example, if I have a text, perhaps from a newspaper that students um, would read with me, it contained a grammar point that I was gonna focus on that day, and I'd present the, the reading, and then of course I would focus my intention on the grammar point. For example purposes, perhaps it would be good to talk about maybe por and para in Spanish. As my students and I read the passage together, I'd ask the students for examples found in the text of por and para, and we'd discuss the meaning of those words in the target language. I never got out of the target language. Afterwards, we'd work together and create a new text using the same theme, but including por and para as needed. And after that, of course, there'd be an extension activity that the students would do. All of this was carried out in the target language instead of listing all the rules of when to use por and when to use para, which there are a lot of rules, right? And of course, all the different meanings associated with the context of the sentence. I'd have them focus on the meaning and integrate the grammar into a meaningful context. And I just got to tell you, it works exceedingly well. And the students not only remember it, but they use it in the target language. So some tips for teaching grammar online, just like in a regular traditional classroom, you've got to make sure that you are, you know, presenting and using the vocab grammar and vocabulary within a meaningful cultural context. And one of the pitfalls to avoid when teaching online, um, a lot, you know, the textbooks that we use in our classrooms um, are these, this, these books are also available online, but the majority of them uh, have a, a heavy emphasis on focus on form activities. So in a classroom, teachers will typically maybe use a couple of book activities, but then create their own activities. The same thing has to take place online, because if you are having your students engage in those mechanical drill activities, it's not going to be effective. Um, an article by Wong and Van Patten in 2003, the evidence is in drills or out, found that uh, these activities are not useful at all for having students learn uh, a foreign or second language. So be very selective in the activities that you have your students engage in. Make sure that they're meaningful and then avoid assigning those activities that are with the heavy focus on form. Another thing that I find helpful is to show students up front how I evaluate them. When I evaluate them, meaning is, is the king. I want them to make, get their meaning across and accuracy, while it's important, it's not the most important thing. So when they see my rubrics in advance, that uh, grammatical accuracy is one small part. And if they're getting their meaning across and communication takes place, that is much more important than the students relax and they find out what is really important. No, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. That, that's fantastic. Of course, core practice four, as we noted earlier, is guiding learners to interpret and discuss authentic texts. And this core practice fits nicely with the last one. In fact, I highly recommend it using authentic text when presenting grammar and for simply just reading for pleasure. There's so many wonderful texts in the form of videos, news, audio clips, of course, that can be used in the classroom. And interestingly, my advanced students in high school fell in love with 19th century Spanish short stories, and I'd use them in class. In fact, those stories are compiled into a book that I edited a number of years ago because my students urged me to do so. They liked them so much. 
If you've taken the time to learn more about extensive reading or the overall benefits of reading, you know the, port, the importance and the value that authentic texts have in the language classroom. And of course, they can't be overstated. Just catch Victoria Rodrigo or Stephen Cash crashing at Actful in November at Actful and bend their ear about it. They'd love to talk to you about it, I'm sure. Authentic texts are a tremendous source of comprehensible input, to say the very least. When selecting an authentic text, there's a few guidelines that Vicki Galloway at Georgia Tech have advanced. Um, first, the text must be context and age appropriate for the level being taught. And a key concept is that if any editing needs to take place, you edit the task and not the text. So I'm going to share with you some wonderful resources for finding authentic materials online. Um, the first one you see here, the first bullet point is Lang Media Archive. This is one of my favorites. This is a searchable collection of video clips of native speakers performing everyday actions. Literally everything from greeting a friend on the street to getting a haircut. These are these everyday things that are not necessarily included in the textbook, but make language really interesting to learn. This is also a great way to teach your students pragmatics. That's how language is used in socially and culturally appropriate ways. And these, um, these uh, video clips are really short. They're about five minutes. And they have transcripts in the target language and in English. And they're available in, in 35 languages. So even critical languages can benefit from this resource. Today's Front Pages is an open access website that offers the daily front page headlines from over 2,000 newspapers around the world. This is a wonderful authentic resource because these newspapers were created by native speakers for native speakers. What a better way to have your students learn perspectives of other cultures than by reading about their uh, newspaper articles from around the world. Merlot. Um, and the Realia Project are two open access resources where students and instructors can contribute to and uh, receive work from others. This has, these two um, resources have the open access philosophy. That's where we contribute and share with each other. The whole community will advance. Merlot has tutorials, web quests, animations, simulations, Realia, Realia and reference tools for numerous languages, all of the commonly taught and numerous less commonly taught languages. And the Realia project, it's, um, it's images that are taken by um, language teachers and students around the world, and these are curated by faculty, so they are all appropriate and safe to use, including in public school environments. And I just love the Realia Project. I've uh, put some work in there. It's, it's just a tremendous, tremendous resource. The fifth core practice is backwards design, and it's where the teacher starts with the end in mind. The focus, of course, is placed on functional learning goals and objectives, and the activities and assessments that meet those objectives. Of course, what we, what we start out with is we set our learning outcomes, our learning objectives first, and of course, in terms of communication and not grammar. Then we determine um, that what the language learners are going to know, of course, though, how they're going to meet these outcomes and goals. Then, of course, you create your assessments, and hopefully they're created as integrated performance assessments. Afterwards, the teacher plans for instruction. Of course, this runs counter to the way a teacher explained his planning to me so many years ago that he'd start with a chapter in the first page, and then go to the second page, and go to the third page, and then was near the end of the chapter, he'd write a test which of course was based on grammar and knowledge of the language instead of communication using language. As I worked with teacher candidates in our own program, once they begin to think in terms of how to approach a unit or a chapter using backwards design, it's then when they find teaching using communicative language teaching approaches so easy. And of course, their students quickly realize that they can use the language to communicate instead of being able to just recite grammatical rules. And backward design is a process that's really key when designing uh, an online language course. And we use the model called ADDI, Analyze, Design, Develop, Implement, and Evaluate. I'm not going to get into that here because there are modules available in this series on ADDI. And ADDI is the process we use when we develop our online courses. We need to know our end goals first. And an effective online language class 
will make sure that these weekly outcomes are tied to the course learning outcome. So the first place you start when designing an online course is the end course outcomes. And then you build, you go backwards from there. And we suggest that um, the getting started module, that's the very first thing that students do when they get into your class, we suggest doing that last because uh, if you're if you're starting from from the backward design approach um, you're going to be starting out with your outcomes you're going to build, you're going to create your assessments and then go backwards from there so you you can learn more about that in the mo in the modules that focus on Addy in this series of course the, the the last core practice is providing appropriate feedback and speaking and writing on various learning tasks and, you know, um, while the jury is still out really on what type of feedback is, is the best, being a recast or an elicitation, right, we do know that students need and appreciate feedback, especially when it's immediate. Oral corrective uh, feedback promotes second language acquisition. I don't think there's any, any um, thing that could contradict that. Like so many researchers, ACTFL suggests that teachers use a wide variety of feedback strategies to help the language learners be implicit or explicit. As noted in the red slide there, um, feedback online can be either spoken or written. For me personally, I try to give feedback to students as much as I can because of course it helps improve their language skills and build their sense of efficacy so they start to believe that they can learn a second language and they can communicate a second language. I always start with something positive in my feedback and then provide any corrective feedback after that as I promote output instead of just giving some sort of appraisal of an utterance. Victoria? Yes, and another thing with, uh, with uh, feedback online, you can build online rubrics that can be used again and again. And it's much easier to grade online, I feel, because I, I'm recycling my rubrics and you're simply clicking on them and then you type in your feedback to the student or if it's um, a pronunciation issue, it's very easy to make a quick recording, a one, two minute recording, and send that to the student. So you can provide feedback um, orally and in writing. Well, fantastic. Um, well, Victoria and I have discussed these six core practices rather quickly, right? Actually, has a number of resources available in the, in the form of webinars, books, workshops, and of course the annual convention, which will take place in November in Nashville, Tennessee this year. And even if I weren't on the ACTFL board as past president right now, I would strongly urge all language teachers and administrators to attend the annual convention. I published a study in 2012 that shows that language teachers who were members of their national organization had a stronger sense of efficacy in teaching languages. Other research has shown that language learners with teachers who possess a strong sense of efficacy outperform students of teachers who have a lower sense of efficacy. So I really recommend to each ACTFL member that they bring a colleague with them to Nashville. As you know, it's an amazing experience each year. Plus, this year we're celebrating our 50th uh, convention. Um, if you weren't um, uh, at the convention last year, we unveiled the new book by uh, Eileen Glisson, Rick Donato, and it's um, available online um, via the uh, ACTFL website. It really digs into these six core practices, and Drs. Glisson and Donato just did simply a great job in presenting these core practices. I would uh, like to encourage everyone, if you want further information, to get a copy of that Gleason and Donato book, Enacting the Work of Language Instruction. Come to the 2017 convention in Nashville. And we'd like to end by thanking our colleagues at the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii for all of their assistance in recording this presentation and all of their assistance in, in building the online mentoring program. We'd also like to thank ACTFL for supporting this program. And I'd like to thank you for um, spending the time listening to our presentation today.